Okay. Uh, so we start a new uh, session, and uh, first with Professor Yossi Hayes. He is the director of the Center for the St Study of the Jewish of Jewish Culture and professor of Jewish history at the University of Haifa. His research interests uh, include Kabbalah, early modern, Jewish uh, ego documents, women's religiosity, history of attitude toward magic and practical Kabbalah, and the visualization of uh, knowledge. He is currently directing the Israel Science Foundation supported Ilanot project, which is working to catalog and describe all Kabbalistic cosmological diagrams. Yossi Reyes received his PhD at Yale University. He has previously been awarded Fulbright, Rothschild, Wexner, Hartmann, and Katz Center Fellowship, and conduct research in Israel, Germany, and the States. Among his publications, let's mention Between Worlds, the book Exorcist and Early Modern Judaism in 2003. His book, The Tree of Holiness, a 19th century visualization of Kabbalah, will be pu published by Kerup Press. And Yossi Reyes wrote many articles on visual Kabbalah, Kabbalistic trees, and a critical edition of uh, Nathan of Gaza. Mahamar Haigulim, Discourse of the Circles, also on Kabbalah practices and practical Kabbalah, magic, mysticism, and a popular belief in Jewish culture. And the topic of his paper is Visual Kabbalah in the Bodleian Library. Please. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Um, <coughs> I have the, the challenge of speaking after lunch, so I try to keep it colorful and interesting as much as I can, and uh, will not speak extemporaneously so that I make sure that I do justice to the topic today. So with apologies for reading, I'll begin. It is truly a pleasure and indeed a great honor to have been invited to participate in this extraordinary 500th birthday celebration. I'm grateful to, to Dr. Rachel Fronda in particular, and not only for the invitation. Rachel has been incredibly helpful to me since I first contacted her by email nearly a decade ago. On many occasions, her generous responses to last-minute queries were critical to my work. Moreover, her intelligence, erudition, warmth, and enthusiasm have made every interaction with her over these years a delight. To be perfectly honest, I didn't really have time to come to Oxford this week, but can't say no to Rachel, so thank you. Um, my engagement with the Hebrew manuscript collections in Oxford began when I founded the Ilanot project about a dozen years ago. For a number of years, it seemed sufficient to make use of the National Library of Israel microfilms and a few specially ordered images. My earlier research projects had not demanded immersion, let alone expertise in manuscripts, or so at least I thought at the time. So it took a while for me to understand the added value of inspecting the original artifacts. When that penny finally dropped, however, it was clear that visiting Oxford was a top priority. The history of visual Kabbalah could hardly be told without its manuscripts. It might even be said that the history of visual Kabbalah could quite nearly be told with its manuscripts. In my presentation today, I should like to give a sense of the latter and point to manuscripts in Oxford collections that reveal key chapters in the history of visual Kabbalah, as well as no few of its fascinating byways. First, however, a few words on visual Kabbalah broadly and on the genre of Ilanot in particular. The term visual Kabbalah was coined by my dear friend, Professor Giulio Buzzi, whose pioneering Kabbalah Visiva of 2005 surveyed the graphical images of Jewish mystical literature. 
As he reflected a few years later, Buzi's appreciation for the visual aspect of Kabbalah began when he picked up a Lurianic manuscript in the library of the Jewish community of Mantua. Suddenly, he wrote, I was struck by a beautiful drawing of the spherotic worlds which occupied an entire page. I looked at it for a while, then an idea came to my mind. The Kabbalah is not only theory, but, as, at least as far as manuscripts are concerned, also a visual experience. The diagrammatic images of the Jewish mystical tradition were not unknown to scholars, who were only too happy to use them as eye candy for book covers or to illustrate their publications. But as odd as it sounds, none of them had ever devoted a single study to visual Kabbalah, neither broadly speaking nor of a given artifact. Gabriel, Gabriel said that Raina's 1980 article on Huntington Additional E, the Hepburn Ilan, that I'll touch upon shortly, is the exception that proves the rule, writ written as it was by an art historian. In my view, the lack of scholarly attention to visual Kabbalah paralleled the lack of interest in scientific and theological diagrammatic illustration among intellectual and art historians that was de rigueur until well into the 1980s. In a nutshell, intellectual historians were only interested in texts and art historians only in images that qualified as art. My own epiphany came early in 2007 when visiting my friend Dr. Menachem Kalos for a Shabbat lunch in Jerusalem. Menachem had been contracted by the great Jewish art collector William Gross to describe the content visualized in his collection of Kabbalistic rotuli or ilanot. William had collected such artifacts for 30 years by that time and, as he'd always done, sought consultations with academics with relevant expertise and with whom he could freely share his treasures. In this case, however, none of the scholars he consulted could tell him anything about these rotuli because, as we know, they had never been studied. Finally, Professor Moshe Idel suggested that William commission Menachem to provide at least provisional explanations of their content. To make a long story short, upon seeing crudely taped A4 photocopies of William Zila notes strewn over Menachem's, uh, all the surfaces in his home that afternoon, I realized that an entire genre had never been subjected to basic research. Boozy's impressionistic survey notwithstanding. My first Israel Science Foundation application emerged from that insight and basic research on the genre has continued unabated to the present day. I'm delighted to report that a number of scholars, uh, junior as well as senior, and here I'd just like to take a moment to uh, acknowledge and thank the, uh, the people with whom I collaborate on a daily basis on this work, Drs. Eliezer Baumgart and Uri Safrai and Hannah Gentili, among them. Um, uh, and also now I should say my, my MA student, Camille Imperato, is here today. Because of COVID, I meet her now for the first time here in Oxford, even though she's doing her MA with me and she's working on an important topic in visual Kabbalah that I will mention in just a few moments. But these, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that everybody's publishing now on visual Kabbalah. That's my impressionistic sense, at least. They've taken a keen interest in these materials, and publications on visual Kabbalah are multiplying. With regard to Ilanot, specifically, I've also been able to synergize grants from the Israel Science Foundation and the Volkswagen Foundations to develop a platform for their research and presentation in scientific editions, the first phase of which is already online in beta uh, at www.ilanot.org. If we have time at the end, I'm, I'd really be happy to click on that link and show you what it can do, but if I don't, um, you'll see it's, uh, the site already has um, most of the important classical Ilanot or pre-Lurianic Ilanot, and the second phase of the project is now just beginning that will deal with the Lurianic materials. Let me get back now to my assertion that the history of visual Kabbalah could largely be told as a show and tell on this campus and do just that. It's only right, liftoch uh, b'chvod achsanya, as we say when we speak Aramaic, I suppose, or a mixture, <laughs> to open uh, in a manner that honors our venue. Not an image, 
but a text that opens introductions and keys appropriate for all who would enter the wisdom of the Kabbalah to know. An introduction to the Kabbalah uh, produced in early 16th century Italy. And uh, here I quote from uh, the beginning of the text, one who begins the study of this wisdom must know that he must first learn all of the drawings, tziurim, and how all the worlds descend, mishtal shalim, one after another. And all of them must be drawn, mitsuyarim, before him. According to the anonymous author of this work, to be a student of the Kabbalah is to visualize its knowledge as graphical, no less than mental image. This introduction to Kabbalah concludes with a final project. The student is to draft a large and complex figure to represent the knowledge acquired in the preceding chapters on the basis of very precise and technical verbal instructions to which the entire final chapter is devoted. Now this, uh, what you're seeing now is the beginning of this technical uh, instruction uh, in that final chapter. Christ Church Manuscript 188 preserves this final chapter, which has a, its own title, Seder Tziur Ha'ilan, the order of the drawing of the tree, the ilan here in the genre sense and not in the schema sense, the order of the drawing of the ilan over 10 densely inscribed folio pages without a single illustration. A still unrealized desideratum is the realization of these instructions by a qualified contemporary draftsperson. Preliminary sketches undertaken by David Friedman, the noted Kabbalistic artist of Tzfat, suggest that the resulting rhodalus would have no little in common with the graphical features of the most elaborate of classical ilanot, the so-called magnificent parchment. If the still-to-be-realized ilan would far exceed the graphical complexity and scale of the magnificent parchment, which you're seeing uh, scroll behind me, the latter would hardly need relinquish its claim to magnificence, bearing as it does a plethora of secondary diagrams and a 33,000 word miscellany that extracts passages from the full range of sources available to Italian Kabbalists of the late 15th century. One of the finest witnesses of the magnificent parchment is to be found in the Bodleian manuscript, uh, uh, Huntington additional, oh no, it's just Hunt, isn't it? Just Hunt, right? <laughs> I'm in Oxford, you better correct me, yeah? But you, uh, additional D. Uh, this, by the way, based on the Oxford or the, the Bodleian witness is already available on www.elano.org completely transcribed and completely translated, although the translation is still being uploaded. We have to deal with some XML issues, but it's very far along and it can already be enjoyed even though the site really is a, in beta and doesn't have many of the end user features implemented that should become available in the coming uh, year or two. The, uh, the genre did not, however, begin with such jaw-dropping artifacts. Its origins are to be found in the 14th century with much simpler parchments upon which arboreal diagrams, um, sorry, didn't mean to do that, uh, upon which arboreal diagrams were drawn. The fundamental Kabbalistic axiom is that the divine is revealed as 10 networks sfirot. The divine, the light of God that flows through their structured array generates all of reality. This array was often visualized with the arboreal schema known in Hebrew, like the genre itself, as an ilan. Because the sfirot were thought by Kabbalists to generate reality and to respond to its vicissitudes, tikkun, the enhancement and reparation of the cosmos, required the intentional intervention of the Kabbalist. This fundamental Kabbalistic work demanded that the mystic imaginatively engage with the sfirotic tree. Oppenheim additional folio manuscript 54 provides a lovely 16th century Sephardi script example of the integration of a simple ilan into the prayer book with precisely this aspiration in mind. Another example of an ilan designed to be worked with may be found in manuscript Michael 342. 
Its medallions have been augmented with volvelles, each inscribed with the names of all ten sefirot. This mechanical ilan, innovated by Moses Cordovero for his Pardes Rimonim, was intended to provide the student with a physical experience that would communicate the sympathetic basis of the internal connectivity of the Kabbalistic tree. In the medallions, channels, interstitial spaces, and margins of classical ilanot, their makers inscribe texts that pertain to their locations on the parchment, closely related to the most common genre of early Kabbalistic literature, the Perushim al Eser Sfirot, commentaries on the Ten Sfirot, these early Ilanot, then known by the synecdote Yeriot, parchments, clustered the names and appellations of the Sfirot in their respective medallions and animated the system by detailing its internal network of channels and the dynamic flow that coursed through them. Although no early parchment Ilanot are in Oxford, to the best of my knowledge, indeed precious few have reached us, their codex reductions may be found in a number of Bodleian manuscripts. Michael 38, oh wait, this is still showing us 54. Ah, I meant to show you that before, apparently. And here is, ah, I don't know, maybe this is a mistake. Boop. No, I think this is a, okay, whatever it is. This, I think. I, uh, this, what we're seeing now, shows us a denary ilan, a ten, ten medallion ilan, that its scribe thought best presented on a slightly oversized fold-out page. The texts found in its medallions number the sfirot, provide their primary names in a cursive script, followed by their associated divine names, the latter in bold square script. Ox, uh, Oppenheim, manuscript 561, gives a better idea of what one sort of Elan parchment reduction looks like, compressing, it as it does, a fair number of spherotic appellations, or kinuyim, into these medallions as well. These are extracted from the work to which the diagrammatic page was appended, Sha'arei Chaim, a mid-16th century introduction to the Sfirot by the Italian Kabbalist Mordechai Rosillo. So you can see I made a little bit uh, detailed uh, enlargement here, where you see the name of the Sfira, Tiferet, Ze'er is uh, a name from the Idrot, the divine name, one of the so-called unerasable names, the Tetragrammaton, the Vav from the Tetragrammaton, it says Zer Anpin, sorry, Karosh Baruch Hu, Holy One, Blessed Be He, um, and so forth, the Torah Shebikhtav, uh, the written Torah, the Shamaim, Yaakov, Israel, Adam, Nahar, all these are considered uh, appellations of the Sfirot. So this is, they're aggregated in their location on the tree. Oppenheim 458 actually contains both a classical and a Lurianic Ilan. In the case of the latter, it's what I call the Ilan of expanded names, or Ilan Miluim which we'll meet again soon, each on an oversized fold-out sheet. Their juxtaposition in this manuscript likely explains an enigmatic Ilan printed by Christian Knorr von Rosenrot in his Kabbalah de Nudata in 1677, which is a little mystery that I get into in my forthcoming book, The Kabbalistic Tree. I'll leave that as a teaser for you. Um, we may compare these with the early Ilan parchments held by the Vatican and Brescia libraries. I should note that uh, codex adaptations of early parchments, albeit not those in Oxford's collection, often retain more of the textual content found on the original parchments, sometimes even augmenting that, that textual content. So we're seeing just, uh, so you, you know, these are two of the oldest that I've found so far. This one in the Vatican, uh, a fascinating Ilan produced in Crete in the 15th century, and this one is undated, but my paleography consultants uh, say it was either written in Spain or by a Spanish uh, uh, immigrant uh, to Italy sometime also uh, at the end of the 15th century. And uh, with the texts are uh, primarily based on works by Joseph Gicatila, the 13th century Spanish Kabbalist. These are not anthological, but 
give one introduction to the Sfirot arranged uh, on the parchment, uh, on, the, on the basis of location. So as I said though, these are most often found in terms of the numbers of manuscripts that we have in reductions of one form or another that can, uh, we saw the examples in, in the Bodleian uh, were relatively sparsely inscribed with uh, this textual material, but if we look at uh, other uh, manuscripts found elsewhere, you see examples of the actual aug augmentation of the material through different strategies. Um, so you c it, these uh, very full uh, uh, reductions, you could say, of the Ilanot could be accomplished either by dedicating two pages to the reduction, as we find in the Munich manuscript you see here on the right, or by what I call deconstructing the Ilan over a series of pages, as we see, for example, in Vatican uh, Hebrew manuscript 456, uh, where you get kind of vestigial graphical material from the parchment. The medallions are usually there. Sometimes you get little beginnings of channels, but for the most part, uh, the, you have the medallions. And when, they, when you have a codex, you have a, a notebook like that, you can include all the text you want and, of course, add more uh, as you like. <clears throat> that also is the, the case with a Munich manuscript where you see the scribe said, I found this elsewhere, and you, know, you have a kind of aggregation of material. Since, it's, since these classical Ilanot are all about giving people more information about this, he wrote, as the scribes, copyists, Kabbalists, found more material, they could go back to these uh, and add as they thought uh, appropriate. We may have to look elsewhere for examples of simple classical Ilanot, but this lacuna is more than made up for by two parchments held by the Bodleian. The Rodeli, now known as uh, Hunt Additional D and E, each is extraordinary in every respect. The bold colors and illuminations of the latter are undoubtedly what attracted the attention of Sedraina, an art historian who could hardly make sense of its Kabbalistic content but fully appreciated its fantastic backstory. A richer contextualization of uh, this manuscript was provided by Anthony Grafton and Joanna Weinberg in their wonderful 2011 book on Isaac Cozobon. To recount only the barest but telling details of this Ilan is an embellished reconstruction of what was likely a 14th century Italian Ilan that had been acquired by Cardinal Egidio di Viterbo. That old Ilan made its way to Cozobon via the library of Catherine de' Medici the Italian noblewoman who became Queen of France. And that library arrived in Paris in 1599. Cosobon was so daunted by the difficulty of reading the Ilan, particularly in its deteriorated condition, that he commissioned an accomplished Hebraist, who also happened to have, have formidable talents as a draftsman, to copy it for him. The latter was a Scotsman by the name of Jacob Hepburn, or James Hepburn, who called himself in Hebrew Yaakov Hevron. Hepburn's reconstruction is in fact the only extant copy of what was known in the 14th century as the Great Parchment, a Yiri'ah Gedola, in its original rotaless format. Hepburn had a penchant for Christianity validating syncretistic Prisca Theologia, or ancient theology. The same man who copied the Ilan you just saw put his skills and sensibilities uh, to work in this sumptuous manner in, in, uh, in a large engraving entitled Virga Oria, a golden rod, an ico iconotextual feast that praises the Virgin in a Kabbalistic whirlwind of 72 different alphabets. Hepburn prepared it with the engraver Philippe Thomasin and printed it in Rome in 1616 while serving as the curator of Oriental manuscripts in the Vatican. And this was hard to find, but I'm, so I'm, very, I'm still so thrilled every time I see it. The great parchment differs from simple classical Ilanot by virtue of its supplementation, oh, okay, by, by virtue of its supplementation of an idiosyncratic commentary on the Sfirot composed by the 14th century Italian Kabbalist Ruben Sorfati to the classical the standard classical model. So the Vatican and Brescia 
simple Ila note, had the text from Jikatila, the great parchment is a, takes again a basic classical model of names and appellations and channels that are labeled and aggregate information about the Sfirot and adds uh, a commentary or introduction to the Sfirot. In the case of uh, this one, the, all of this textual material is, is uh, a work sometimes referred to as Igeret Sipurim, uh, because it tells the story of the Sefirot as stories. Uh, nobody really understood what it was, and Sholem accidentally called it Igeret Purim. And in the National Library catalog, it's still called Igeret Purim today. It has nothing to do with Purim, I'm sorry to say, as a big Purim fan. But, uh, so this is Sorfati. Again, not, uh, not anthological. But when we go to um, the other... Uh, additional manuscript D, we see a different approach to the enhancement and augmentation of the classical Ilan. Sometime around 1500, its anonymous maker availed himself of his Kabbalistic bookshelf, including its visual repertoire as well. The texts alone constitute, as I said, a formidable 33,000 word Kabbalistic miscellany, which Sholem described in an unpublished note as an unbekannter reason text, an unknown gigantic text. On the one hand, I know because I went to Sholem's archives that he saw it, but I also know he didn't bother to read it. So, okay, the central arboreal figure was drawn upon a rotilus formed of multiple stitched parchment sheets. With consummate skill and thoughtfulness, he filled the parchment with hundreds of discrete visual elements diagrammatic schemata, symbolic forms, and decorative embellishments around and within which he inscribed texts. Atop the highest sefira of Keter, the infinite is figured as an open eye with Ein Sof inscribed. It's the center of the iris. The texts are no less interesting. Even in the eye, they're taken from uh, Platonic texts that were translated by Hillel of Verona. The, the sources are unbelievable that were brought into dialogue on this parchment. But there are also uh, dragons and snakes and bubbling wells and flowing rivers. Here you have a little dragon for you. Um, and most surprisingly, I think it's fair to say, uh, rabbis. Here you see Rabbi Akiva standing amongst the Kruvim, the beasts of the chariot. The central arboreal figure hovers above, a f hovers above the throne of glory, which in turn sits upon the chariot. Beneath the Kruvim, the engines of the chariot, is an intricate representation of the zodiac that occupies roughly the, a third of the rotilus. The aspiration to provide a total cosmological picture is thus evident. I'm happy to report that the Oxford witness of the magnificent parchment, one of roughly a dozen complete or frag fragmentary witnesses, is now available on the Maps of God portal. The text has been fully transcribed and translated and so forth. Okay. The magnificent parchment is clearly the pinnacle of classical Ilanot, and if we may judge by the dating of its extant witnesses, its value was appreciated for centuries. It's also true that the simpler expressions of uh, Classical Ilanot were copied well into modernity because they re remained valuable, particularly to beginning students of Kabbalah. The Kabbalah inspired by the teachings of Rabbi Isaac Luria during the period of his activity in Sfat in the early 1570s was, as is widely known, considerably more intricate than anything that preceded it. A comparison with Newtonian and Einsteinian physics may be in order. Not that the older cosmology was wrong, it simply described the divine realm at a far lower resolution than the new. The daunting difficulty of learning Luriana Kabbalah was apparent from its origins, beginning with Luria's own inspired rather than systematic approach to sharing his interpretive extrapolations from the most recondite uh, compositions in Zoharic literature, the Sifra de Tziniuta and the Idrot. His disciples, Rabbi Chaim Vital, foremost among them, struggled to distill a coherent system from his intricate insights. Many wrote and rewrote abridged treatises to provide overviews to orient the bewildered student. In the mid-17th century, inspired by classical Ilanot, Rabbi Jacob Tzemach, 
the leading Lurianic Kabbalist of his age, fashioned the first Ilan, Lurianic Ilan. I think it's fair to say that pedagogic aims were foremost in his mind, though these would also have included contemplative exercises. Semach's goal was to provide the student of Lurianism with a graphical visualization of its central concept of Hitlabshut, which may be clumsily translated as enclothing. Hitlabshut is the diachronic process by which the lower dimensions of higher expressions of divinity nest within their analogs, the higher dimensions of the lower expressions of divinity. The pure light of simple divinity, Ein Sof, shines through the entire expanse of differentiated creation, beginning with primordial Adam, Adam, Kadmon, whose lights enrobe in the div divine personas, or parzufim that follow, down to their very feet, all of which stand on the same ground of the lowest world, despite the progressive differentiation of their respective starting points, or heads. To do its work, the classical Ilan need only provide a schema, which might be likened to a map for the ordered presentation of the names of the Sfirot and their networking. Tzemach, however, used the real estate provided by the large format of the Ilan genre, particularly the long length of these rotuli, to visualize a process, a process, thereby making the Ilan as much a timeline as a map of the divine. Tzemach's Ilan of enclothing, which you see a, a detail of uh, here, likely spread first in copies of Otsrot Chaim, a foundational work of Luriana Kabbalah composed by Vital that had been consigned to the Geniza of Jerusalem. Upon its recovery, decades later, Tzemach took on the responsibility of its restoration, as he did for other treatises recovered at the time. Otsrot Chaim stands out, however, for having survived uh, the appalling conditions of the Geniza largely intact. Moreover, it is an unusually coherent and mechanistic presentation of the fundamentals of Lurianic cosmology. Even without the augmentation of Tzemach Zilan, Otsrot Chaim is one of the most richly diagrammed works of Lurianic Kabbalah. Tzemach's editorial practices were such that we can be confident that the earliest manuscripts preserve copies of diagrams that were in Vital's autograph. Zakuto, uh, Moshe Zakuto, for his part, who uh, added a diagram of his own to Otsurot Chaim, sought to spread it through a concerted copying effort that produced over 80 copies, 38 in Italian script, 32 in Ashkenazi script, 9 in Eastern or Iraqi script, and 4 in Western or Moroccan script, all produced in his atelier and his workshop in Italy. One must go to the British Library, I, sorry to have to mention your competitors, to see the Italian copies. But here in Oxford, one can expect a number of Ashkenazi copies, both in the Michael and Oppenheim collections. Um, let's have a look at uh, what, the, what the Bodleian can illustrate of the above. Now, I've done too much talking and not enough picture showing. Uh, Tzemach's Ilan of enclothing was not packaged with the Ashkenazi Otsrot Chaim copies, but can be found as an integrated module of the great trees that began appearing in the late seven, in the 17th century, or late in the 17th century. When I say great trees, I refer to Lurianic Ilanot that spliced together previously independent Ilanot to, find, to form long composite rotuli. A favorite great tree of mine is the front matter fold-out that's over two and a half meters long in manuscript Oppenheim 128 a late 17th century Kabbalistic miscellany that begins with Semach's commentary on the Idr Rabbah. One reason I'm so fond of this witness is that it continues a tradition that began with Chaim Vital himself, to open cosmological treatises with a large format fold-out diagram that provides a structural overview of the system detailed in the treatise to which it has been appended. The Ilan of Oppenheim 128 also provides a fine example of an early great tree that splices Tzemach's Ilan to the end of an Ilan fashioned by Tzemach's disciple, Rabbi Meir Popers. Around 1650, Popers sought to provide a far more detailed visualization of the enrobing process for his own students in Krakow. And he had the audacity to begin at the beginning with the face of Adam Kadmon, the primordial Adam. 
uh, this is the face of Adam Kadmon as it's found in Oppenheim 128. Our scribe, it must be said, did a poor job with this most representational component of the Ilan. For a copy that pre presents the other end of the aesthetic spectrum, we might uh, have a look at the great tree with the same components uh, preserved in Cambridge Trinity, uh, in the Cambridge Trinity Library. And here's the same head of Adam Kadmon on that Cambridge Trinity scroll. Now, Poppers was not the only Luriana Kabbalist to attempt schematic readings of the head of Adam Kadmon. Azriel of Korotsin, a 17th century Kabbalist from Poland and Germany, diagrammed the, a head of Adam Kadmon that makes for an interesting comparison to the one atop the Poppers Ilan. Azriel's, however, was not part of an Ilan. It appears in his visual presi of Otsrot Chaim that he titled general and specific dimensions of the emanatory chain and so forth. Now, Azriel almost certainly copied this, composed the brief nine folio comp companion, the, audio, uh, the autograph codex of which is now Oppenheim manuscript uh, 456, while he was studying Vital's Otsrotkaim under Zakuto in Mantua. It's all, it, it's all connected. So this is here in Mantua. There's a, another copy made by ostensibly uh, uh, on the basis of this Oppenheim manuscript. The tradition of binding Ilanot into the front or back matter of Luriana cosmological treatises was nowhere executed with greater scribal prowess than in the series of illuminated Etz Chaim volumes produced over at least two decades, if not more, by the Altona-based scribe Israel ben Asher Buchbinder. Buchbinder bound a fold-out of the aforementioned Ilan of expanded names into every illustrated volume he made from 1727 to 1749, six of which are extant. A seventh was produced in 1774, either by Buchbinder or by a devoted and very talented scribal artist as an homage to the master. The 1774 colophon credits Buchbinder as the scribe and artist, though scribes were, here you can see, hasofer vehametzayer. Also here he calls himself, ani hasofer vehametzayer. Scribes were known on occasion to copy colophons, including uh, the names of the original uh, a scribe and not the name of the scribe who made the copy. So we, I don't know if Buchbinder made the 1774 copy, but the, Bo the Bodleian collection includes the two earliest copies we know of from 1727 and 1728 and the latest one from 1774. Buchbinder's volumes provide far more visual Kabbalistic content than their Ilanot, however. These are richly diagrammed editions of Etz Chaim. A slightly different redaction of the work uh, would be pr printed in Koritz in 1785. But in these editions include a number of diagrams rarely, if ever, seen elsewhere. Moreover, they exhibit a lush decorative program, especially beginning with the volume that was likely Buchbinder's third effort, a 1770 copy, which is now in Prague. The fact that seven luxury manuscripts of the same work are extant that were executed by Buchbinder in the same format reveals a surprising readiness to adorn even the most esoteric literature, in this case, material that a century before was closely guarded by its gatekeepers, with novel and even representational images from the diagrammatic to the decorative. It also exposes the possibility for commodification of such lore and its effective leveraging by a man who took evident pride in his scribal work and self-identified as what we might call today an artist, a mitzayir. This impression is only strengthened upon consideration of the luxury Luriana Kila note of the period, including that Cambridge Trinity scroll we saw just moments ago. Apropos the images you see now, all were taken from the lavish 1774 witness, all of which were, I must at least point to a work of visual Kabbalah that is exceedingly well represented in the Bodleian collection. It's called Perush Ma'alach Otiot, Commentary on the Pathways of the Letters that Camila is writing her MA thesis about as we speak. 
a short treatise that was frequently copied into Lurianic miscellanies as well as Ilanot. The lower left and center images, these two, uh, were taken from this treatise, which was included by Buchbinder in all of his copies of Etz Chaim. What distinguished this, this Kabbalistic tree is its fidelity to the apodictic assertion of Sefer Yetzirah that the 32 pathways of wisdom by which the cosmos was formed consisted of the 10 sefirot and the 22 Hebrew letters. As in Sefer Yetzirah, the letters were divided into three mothers, seven doubles, and 12 simples. In this visualization, the 10 sefirot are the medallions of the tree, standard. The 10 are in interconnected by precisely 22 channels, the corridors between any two medallions. This is much less standard. Here, however, or moreover, there are precisely three horizontal channels, precisely seven vertical channels, and precisely 12 diagonal channels. This tree is commonly preceded by a drawing of right and left hands portrayed from the perspective of one reading one's own palms. Lines are not the subject of this apparent palmistry, however, but rather the jointed segments of the fingers and thumbs. In most manuscripts, these are keyed to the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The combined message of the tree and the palms is made explicit in the short treatise that they follow, named for its opening words, the judgment of a person after death begins with an inquiry regarding words of Torah. It continues with a simple question, do you know the alphabet? The response is not to be verbal, but gestural. One must show one's hands. The letters are inscribed on them and may be read like a book, specifically Sefer Toldot Adam, the book of the history of that person. We find, I quote, we find that when one opens one's hands, it is like an open book. When one closes one's hands, it is like a closed book, unquote. The author then abandons any literary pretenses and proceeds to list the Sefer Yetzirah inspired associations of each segment of the hands, asserting in the first lines that the reading of the hands is best assisted by juxtaposing them to the Sefirotic tree. Quote, and you'll understand from the drawing of the array of the Sefirot, you'll, un okay. you'll understand by comparing your hands to the tree. In the Bodleian collection alone, I found no fewer than nine manuscripts that include this popular work of visual Kabbalah. One of them, which you're seeing here, was penned by Rabbi, uh, maybe not so much Rabbi, penned by Nosen Neta Chazen Ben Moshe Naftali Hirsch Hammerschlag, artist and provocateur whom I think of as the R. Crumb of 17th century Kabbalists. I'm almost done. I think I've exhausted my time. I, may I humbly request five more minutes from the chair? Thank you. Although it's wise to take anything written by this Kabbalist cantor and delightful doodler with a grain of salt, the colophons and marginalia of his various codices in Ilanot announce Proznitz, Moravia, as his place of birth in 1624. Nossen completed his magnum opus, the Ilan of Adam Kadmon, in Nicholsburg in 1691. The last we hear of him is in 1694 when he crafted, and this is the correct verb to describe the bricolage of the codex, a Lurianic prayer book. Here you just get a sense of his, uh, the codices here in the Bodleian are just astounding. He's taken printed books and pasted and created margins and filled the margins with all kinds of uh, commentaries of his own. In any case, all, uh, all of Hammerschlag's known extant autograph codices are today at the Bodleian, bound together in three volumes, uh, Michael 88, 139, and 147. Uh, two colorful Ilanot, including the aforementioned Ilan of Adam Kadmon, are in Munich. And uh, another Ilan, an early idiosyncratic copy of the Popper's Ilan is in the collection of William Gross in Tel Aviv. The Michael manuscripts may have originated in the library of Jacob Emden, the famous heresy hunter. They'd certainly have earned his ire fair and square, as Hammerschlag was an unrepentant devotee of Shabtai Tzvi for at least 25 years. Sholem was, however, entirely correct when he asserted that Amden failed to understand how, quote, 
true Hasidim and Tzaddikim could also be Sabbatians. An insight entirely applicable to Hammerschlag. The Hammerschlag codices at the Bodleian are gems that cannot but delight all lovers of visually arresting manuscripts and aficionados of the material text. These are no Rothschild miscellanies, mind you, but again, crumb-style graphic novel Kabbalistica. They abound in images that project Hammerschlag's unflagging enthusiasm, a lively spirit already on display in the Popper's Ilan. He copied well before his obsession with Shabtai Tzvi that began in the heyday of the latter's messianic run. I opened by noting that basic research on visual Kabbalah was facilitated by the first Israel Science Foundation grant I received a dozen years ago. Having finally managed to write this lecture, I must immediately turn my attention to writing what will be my fifth personal grant application to the ISF, this time to be earmarked for research of Hammerschlag and his oeuvre. He sorely deserves a monograph, and we scholars will gain much from scientific uh, editions of his fascinating works. In the context of today's panoramic survey of visual Kabbalah and the Bodleian, I can hardly share more than an impression of the riches of this material. Where else, after all, can a scholar of Kabbalah find a 17th century pop-up tongue? <laughs> that tongue is found today in Michael 88, which includes a codex study for the colorful Grand Rodalus that's today in Munich. The, the Bodleian codices are a fascinating repository of information about Hammerschlag's life, his eccentric personality, and the crafty manner in which he expressed his beliefs. Crafty really is the perfect word for Hammerschlag in both its senses. He was clever at achieving his aims by indirect or deceitful methods, and dedicated to the making of decorative manuscripts, colorful ilanot, and bricolage codices. His head of Adam Kadmon, inspired, albeit unencumbered by paupers, is alien-like in this codex study. He's worked out the content, no little of which is benignly subversive, sparkling with winks that betray his love for Shabtai Tzvi, as well as his thorough embrace of Tzvi's signature theological contribution, his secret, namely the preeminence of the personal god, yud heh vav -Hey, over the ultimate god of the philosophers and Kabbalists, the impersonal Ein Sof. To his textual teases, he added astounding visual cues in the Grand Ilan now in Munich. Adam Kadmon had now become a Habsburgian emperor, from imperial crown to curled mustache, his tripartite crown unmistakably modeled on a solid gold masterpiece made in 1602 by Jan Vermeyen in Prague to be the personal crown of Rudolf II. The crown was a beloved symbol, a symbol of the beloved monarchy that was embraced by its Jewish subjects. Adam Kadmon also bears an uncanny resemblance to Leopold I, the reigning Holy Roman Emperor at the time. He'd been emperor for a generation and was the iconic ruler of his age when Hammerschlag began work on his great Ilan. Hammerschlag's Adam Kadmon was no less an image of Shabtai Tzvi. Nossen was in his early 40s when the movement was in his heyday and may have participated in processions carrying a printed portrait of Shabtai, forming the image in his mind, in his mind's eye that would ultimately fuse with the popular icon of Emperor Leopold I to create his Adam Kadmon. <clears throat> this is a certain kind of visual evidence <laughs> for my claim. If my presentation has of necessity provided only a superficial acquaintance with the riches of visual Kabbalah the Bodleian, I hope that a significant however simple, conclusion can nevertheless be drawn from it. The study of visual Kabbalah remains in its infancy with bounteous treasure still awaiting curious cross-disciplinary researchers. So too the study of the Ilanot genre, recognized as such already by 16th century figures including Moshe Cordovero and Guillaume Postel, and part of Kabbalistic practice for some 600 years, but entirely ignored by modern scholars until the 21st century. Thanks to 500 years of commendable Hebrew, Hebrew curatorship, Oxford is an undisputed world capital for the pursuit of this research. May we and the generations we pray will follow us 
Be blessed to live in a world in which such scholarship may be fruitfully pursued in Oxford's exemplary libraries for the next 500 years. Thank you very much. And this, uh, in fact, John's very kind introduction, I should say, mentioned a book that to be forthcoming with Chair Press that will be on the platform. It's not going to be published uh, on paper. But what is coming out on paper in the next couple of weeks is my 500-page encyclopedic, lushly illustrated, coffee table format book called The Kabbalistic Tree. Um, and uh, so that's, that's my exciting publishing event, <laughs> really, to mention. Thank you very much for the fascinating lecture. And yes, Kabbalah is not only text, but also mental, mystical, uh, image, visual experience. Thank you very much. And also thank you for uh, presenting a beautiful, uh, wonderful, magnificent uh, representation. Ah, thank you so from, much. Uh, Sephira. <laughs> So mapping the divine, as you say. I'm so I'm sure a lot of questions. Right, it must have been, <laughs> it must have been unusually <laughs> clear. Or <laughs> people. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. There's just so much. Too much. So much. Embarrassment of riches. No question? One question? Yes, yes. Uh, we need a uh, 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 microphone glass. Microphone glass. Do you think we'll see your book and see everything in there? No, the book is a big, big format. The big book is a big format, but it isn't the best place to to study the the Ilanot. The best place is to go to ilanot.org and to uh, I can I know we don't have any time, but here's uh, the, here's the here's the manuscript Hunt Additional D. Anything you select, you can see it's fully transcribed. Wow. And uh, the translation, where's the translation? Should be here. Bo what is it? Should be. Ah, here, for example, you see. So you have a, for now, you have, you can see the, and this is from Liber de Causus. <laughs> from Latin translated into, well, just Greek to Latin to, <laughs> Greek to Latin to Hebrew and Hillel Verona to, to uh, probably to, possibly to Abu Lafia and from Abu Lafia to our maker. But, uh, I mean, uh, that's, uh, I, I, could, I, can, I can be uh, evasive as, a, as an academic scholar and say I don't have any way of, uh, of assessing that. And the Kabbalists are famously reluctant to share too much uh, in most cases other than perhaps Abu Lafia and uh, his cohorts. We, we don't see them sharing too much about their practices. And, and the, so the backstories behind these artifacts and um, and the ways in which Kabbalists use them are uh, not very well documented. Um, but uh, it's funny, just the other day I was, uh, there's a, a man today working in, in Brooklyn named David Chaim Smith, who combines uh, Kabbalah and alchemy to create kind of modern day Ilanot, describing something very much along the lines that you're asking. He, just, he has, uh, if you speak to me afterwards, I can tell you where to look. He describes his own meditative practices and how they have generated what he calls this uh, uh, cosmological cartography. And he makes really exquisite uh, neo ilanot. I also have a couple of pages on him. At the end of my book, I have a little kind of an epilogue about things going on today that seem to me to be in this tradition. I'm sorry. I have, we have to end. Yes, that's okay. I thought it was going to be a whole day dedicated to the Ilanote, the Bodleian. Yeah, my mistake. Okay. No worries. Thank you, Thank you Jean. Thank you. The next speaker is David Sklar. David studies Jewish history and 
culture in the early modern period. Uh, he earned a doctorate at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and has held a fellowship at Harvard, University Princeton, Oxford, Toronto, New York University, and the Center for Jewish History. His research explores individual intention, communal identities, Jewish, Jewish book history, and correlation between intellectual and social history. He worked for several years in the special collections department of the GTS in New York, where he maintained and catalogs rare Hebrew manuscript and early printed editions, and co-curated exhibition, for example, uh, on uh, Maurice uh, Steinschneider. Uh, currently, he is history instructor and director of the student research at uh, Yeshiva Frisch, and he wrote many articles on Jewish libraries, for example, Etzraim in Amsterdam, also the GTS, also on confraternities in Italy, in Padova, on uh, also Amsterdam, and uh, uh, the Kabbalist uh, uh, Ramchal, the history of Jewish book also in Amsterdam, uh, and he is writing a book on uh, Moshe Luzzato. And the topic of his paper is report of Shabbat Tzvi and the millenarism and messianism uh, in the Oxford and London Gazette. Please. Thank you, Jean. Uh, is there a way to get this going? This thing? Yeah, that thing. No idea what this I should do with this. This one? It's not, yeah. Now we have problems getting this to work. <coughs> That's a problem. That's definitely. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much. I want to echo what uh, every speaker has said already. Uh, thank you to the organizers, specifically to Rachel. I've known Rachel for many years. Uh, I've relied on her continuously, especially over the last few years. Um, it's very nice for me personally to be back in Oxford. The last time I was here, in fact, out of the United States, which is where I live, was the the summer of 2019, before obviously the world changed. I was here for two, year, uh, for two months uh, as part of a seminar, and uh, I, look very, I look back very fondly on that, and uh, I'm very happy to be back. Um, I want to preface my talk with, the first time I was in Oxford was about seven years ago, part of a different seminar, not the one from three years ago. Um, and that was when I met John, and we were working on Jewish books in Amsterdam. And while I was here, I stumbled upon something that I'm going to speak about today, um, which was these references to Shabbat Tzvi in the London Gazette, which is the mouthpiece of the Crown, uh, the oldest continuous uh, newspaper in England. And at the time, I essentially stopped everything I was doing. I was supposed to be working only on Jewish books in Amsterdam. I stopped everything I was doing in order to pursue all of that. And uh, I didn't publish anything at the time about it. I just spent about a month working on it. And I'm very happy to present, at least now, coming back to it. Uh, the other thing I should say is that I'm actually not a historian of English history at all. Uh, but I've worked on Shabtai Tzvi, and uh, so this is, this is a, for me personally, a nice opportunity to present this. In April 1666, the London Gazette reported news from Genoa that the Jewish prophet Sabadai was dead. In gruesome detail, the official paper of the English crown conveyed the end of a short-lived messianic hope. 
This Jew, deemed a traitor at the Ottoman court, received a sentence of flaying. That is, his skin was to be removed while he was living, and a mob fell upon the Jews. The condemned man was led upon an ugly horse while, quote, the heads and arms of his slain followers were strewn along the procession. He was thereby delivered to the executioner who first, first pulled out his tongue, there's another tongue, and then beheaded him, stripping off his skin and hanging up the carcass upon the heels upon a gibbet. The account was fictitious, though as far as the editors of the Gazette were concerned, not intentionally so. A similar report reached an Amsterdam newspaper. In fact, Shabtai Tzvi, who first claimed his role as Messiah in 1648, converted to Islam to save his skin and live for another decade. The movement he inspired swept the Jewish world and beyond for about a year, between the summer of 1665 and the autumn of 1666. It started when Shabbatai, who had wandered for several years in the Levant, connected with Nathan Ashkenazi of Gaza, a young Kabbalist and son of a respected rabbinic scholar and emissary. In the winter and spring of 1665, Nathan reportedly had visions that Shabbatai was the long-awaited Messiah. The second one, the second vision that he had, occurred in public, generating interest and anticipation in the Holy Land and in Egypt. In late September or early October, this is 1665, Nathan sent a letter to Raphael Joseph, a communal leader in Alexandria, imparting his vision of the imminent redemption and describing Shabbatai as mounted on a celestial, fire-breathing lion holding reins of a seven-headed serpent. Convinced, Raphael Joseph produced copies of the missive and sent them to Jewish communities abroad. Over the next few months, news made its way to Poland, Germany, Holland, and Yemen, and active messianism swept much of the Jewish world. Religious sentiment increased, lay people, including women and children, prophesied in the streets and people sold their property in anticipation of a call from and to Jerusalem. Existing social and ethnic divisions also dissolved to some degree in the excitement. Glickel of Hamon described in her diary how the Ashkenazic and Sephardic communities of, Ham of Hamburg, who at best had nothing to do with each other, joined in a single synagogue dressed in Sabbath finery whenever reports of the events in the Ottoman Empire arrived by letter. Scholars have spent decades exploring the various iterations of Sabbatianism. Gershom Sholem's biography of Shabtai Tzvi remains the most authoritative study of the charismatic man and the enthusiasm he inspired. In the decades since, we have had studies on the continued belief in Shabtai as Messiah, the conversion of Islam of groups uh, the, the conversion to Islam of groups of Ottoman Jews known as the Ma'aminim, the believers, the theology of Nathan of Gaza, Abraham Cardozo, and others, Jacob Frank and the movement he inspired, the numerous controversies involving rabbinic figures who secretly harbored beliefs in Shabbatai's messiahship long after he died, and the complicated world of Sabbatian thought and its relationship to Kabbalah and rabbinic ritual. In addition, scholars have looked at Christian attitudes to the movement, specifically during its height. Sorry, I lost my place here. Okay. Most significantly, historian, historians like Richard Popkin and Michael McKeon explore the effects of millenarianism, the correlation between Shabtai Tzvi and the Quaker messianist James Naylor, as was pr proposed by contemporaries, and the general rise of enthusiasm and pietism in the middle decades of the 17th century. More recently, Brandon Marriott, who uh, wrote his dissertation here at Oxford, countered this view, arguing that the majority of Christians in Western Europe exhibited contempt rather than support for the rise of Jewish messianism. My goal today is to present something somewhere in between. The London, and for some time before that, the Oxford Gazette, shows that there was not a clear dichotomy between support and disdain in England. Rather, as the account with which I opened suggests, the editorial voice of the crown, which itself requires some effort to define, expressed a clear fascination with the events. Varied reactions include interest, apprehension, condescension, validation, disbelief, and annoyance. In total, the, the reports from the Gazette do not really concern Shabtai Tzvi or even Jews. The news is wide-ranging, sometimes matching what we know, but frequently spectacular and random. The material falls between the usual understanding of English attitudes towards Jews at, at the time. One, philosomatic, uh, excuse me, philosomatic and or millenarian, which expressed excitement over the Messianic movement. And two, political and potentially ignorant of Jews as individuals, but also potentially in favor of what Jews offered economically. The reports here in the London Gazette, the Oxford and then the London Gazette, I'll explain that soon, waver between the two and exhibit something more nuanced, reflecting the period of change and, uns and uncertainty following Menashe ben Israel's attempts to win the wholesale readmission of Jews to England. 
This, of course, within the larger context of the rule of Oliver Cromwell, the restoration of the monarchy, the plague of 1665, and the fire of London in 1666. The first issue of the London Gazette, although you'll see that it's noted at the, uh, that it was originally the Oxford Gazette, appeared on the 7th of November, 1665, published by authority, as it is stated then and now. You'll see that just below. The purpose was to serve as the mouthpiece of the crown, providing a steady supply of information deemed relevant, countering rumors or criticism easily spread through print. In the early years, the editor was the journalist and publisher, and publisher Henry Muddyman. It's a stroke of hi historiographic luck that the Gazette began amid the momentous events of the plague in 1665, which killed upwards of 15% of the city's population. The Great Fire of London in 1666, which leveled upwards of 15% of the city's housing and the messi messianic hubbub surrounding Shabtai Tzvi, which swept much of the Jewish world. During these early years, the Gazette appeared weekly as a single folio, with stories and reports appearing in double columns on both sides. Issues generally contained more than a dozen, dozen quote-unquote stories, but occasionally they covered only a single major event, such as the Great Fire of London. Though each issue was numbered and included the dates for that week, stories did not necessarily reflect the same immediacy. Correspondence traversed the Mediterranean with maddening inconsistency in the early modern period so that, the report, so that reports could appear in print months after the written source was dispatched. The topics covered in the issues spanned a relatively wide range of information. War or the possibility of war featured prominently with particular concern for the actions of the French monarchy, the Dutch Republic, and ships arriving in British ports, including from North America. In the early years, in the early issues of the Oxford Gazette, the editors ran the death tolls from the plague in London and the amount it increased or decreased from the previous week. And you'll notice that on the right side. When I first came across this in 2015, it didn't mean quite the same that it means now. Charles II had moved his court from London to Oxford for fear of the plague and the Gazette was meant to keep the mercantile classes, the legal profession, and municipal of uh, officials serving at home and abroad apprised of relevant political activity. Politics, of course, consisted of more than troop movements and negotiations, so the Gazette relayed weather reports, tracked ships, informed readers about nobles traveling abroad, listed the annual selections of sheriffs, and followed the activity of certain individuals, such as Sir Jeremiah Smith, who was a, an officer in the Royal Navy, and, of course, the king. Not surprisingly, very few references to Jews appeared, not only in the early years of the paper, but well into the 19th century. Between, in, in this year-long period that I was focused on, I found only two additional references to Jews in the Gazette, meaning beyond the spectacular news about this Messiah. One of them actually was interesting. Uh, evidently, the, the, at least according to the Gazette, um, there was a notice that the Pope's clothing, the Pope at the time was Alexander VII, uh, had been sold to local Jews along with other goods and household items. But, uh, okay, through it all, an editorial voice, sometimes in redacted quietude, other times in overt declamation, influenced the manner in which readers absorbed news. There were no editorials or opinion pieces, but the selection and presentation of the material speaks volumes. Depending on the subject matter, the Gazette could print information verbatim from the given source. For instance, issues in the 18th and 19th centuries inc include excerpts from letters sent to or from a particular front. And of course, as the mouthpiece of the monarchy, the Gazette periodically recorded entire proclamations from the crown. In my research, I came across 13 stories directly referencing or indirectly related to Shabtai Tzvi and the messia messianism of this era, printed between December 1665 and November 1666. Reports came from Harlem in the Netherlands, Vienna, citing Constantinople as a source, Smyrna, where Shabtai originated, Leghorn or Livorno in Italy, and Genoa. The events were reported in waves, beginning in the fall of 1665, again in the spring of 1666, though to be confusing for a moment, that was then 1665, meaning March 25th was the point at which there was a new year, but to simplify everything, we'll treat January 1st as the change of 1666. And then the final wave was a concluding in the autumn of 1666, detailing Shabtai's fall from the grace and the end of the overt messianic movement. The first relevant reference we find, stemming from Harlem the second week of December, reported that a Jewish prophet had arisen and that the ten lost tribes of Israel had descend descended upon Mecca. 
It is now about three months since the Jews gave out that near 600,000 men arrived at Mecca, professing themselves to be of the lost tribes. Since, which it is affirmed, that a new prophet has arisen in Jerusalem, who, finding no credit there, went to Gaza, where, working several miracles, he obliged the rabbis of Jerusalem to repair thither, who, upon a conference, accepted him as a great prophet, and that the pashas of Jerusalem and Gaza inclined to go and kiss his hands. This prophet, say they, foretells the restoration of the house of Israel, and to that purpose hath invited a young man of the tribe of David, called Shabbatai Levi, for their king, who was followed by thousands of people, and that he intended for Constantinople to demand the empire. It is strange that not only the Jews here, but some hundreds that own the name of Christians among us, think themselves concerned in it, though the wiser sort of people sufficiently understand the cheat. Reports of the lost tribes had been stirring for decades. In his Hope of Israel, published in English amid his bid for the official readmission of Jews to England, Menashe ben Israel cited the testimony of Antonio de Montezinos, who claimed to have encountered the remnants of Israel during his travels in South America. Pamphlets declaring similar encounters proliferated in the summer and autumn of 1665. One issued from London reported that a ship with sails of white satin bearing the inscription, these are the ten tribes of Israel docked in Aberdeen with Hebrew-speaking sailors. This first reference in the Oxford Gazette to our subject demonstrated a fundamental problem of fantastic news. In contrast to more basic accounts of the movement of ships, the arrival of ambassadors and the foolishness or immorality of the monarchy's enemies, the text jumbled a multiplicity of issues. One, the appearance of the ten lost tribes of Israel with the number of 600,000 men echoing the biblical record of the newly freed nation wandering in the desert. Two, the arrival of a new Jewish prophet, presumably the young Nathan of Gaza, originally from Jerusalem. Three, the coronation of a Jewish messiah, here named Shabbatai Levi, who intended to make a run on Constantinople. As we will see, the latter political element is likely the reason the Gazette ran with the story, both now and for, all, for the entire year. Though the figure of Shabbatai Levi was an amalgamation of Shabbatai Tzvi and Nathan of Gaza, who was a Levite. So too the explicit condemnation of enthusiastic Christians reflected anti-millenarian views, an editorial voice that seemed to counter the necessity to, print, the necessity to print the fantastic report of an attack on Mecca. In other words, if the editors of the Gazette were reje are rejecting the veracity of the possibility, what is the intention in printing the story? More than a month later, the Oxford Gazette issued the second report that a united federation of Jews and Arabs had destroyed the tomb of Muhammad in Mecca and conquered, quote, several places. The nature of those places was not indicated, be they in Mecca or beyond, but the su supposed expansion sufficiently worried the Ottoman court as to offer the major cities of Tunis and Alexandria in exchange. This is what the report is. There is no comment about Shabtai Tzvi or the goings-on among Ottoman Jewry, and these few lines appear among several other pieces of information coming from Constantinople by way of Vienna. The desecration of Muhammad's tombs, the sacking of Islamic holy places, the unification of Jews and Arabs, and the willing capitulation of the Ottomans reflected an eagerness to report political turmoil in the East. As mentioned, fantastic stories of the ten tribes bolting through Arabia prol proliferated in English pamphlets. Other publications included English translations of letters from Jews driving or swept up in the movement. Over the next year or so, dozens of examples of written accounts with visual depictions also appeared in the Dutch Republic and in German lands. This is a depiction here of Nathan of Gaza leading his people to the Holy Land, along with the anointing of Shabtai Tzvi as king, which is here. And just above that, the desecration of Muhammad's exhumed corpse, sort of in the background. However, these early reports in the Oxford Gazette appeared not with millenarian enthusiasm, but with editorial excitement. The editors were learning on the fly and determining the nature and quality of their newspaper was a learning process. And here I just want to take a diversion for one second on a, something else that I've been working on. This is really the subject of another lecture. The book itself, this is a title page from a book that was printed in Venice in June 1665. The story, as I sort of presented previously, was that Nathan of Gaza had these prophetic experiences, but it really only became public information around September or October in 1665 after he sent this letter to Alexandria. What we have here is an example from June of 1665 of a printer who had gotten wind of this somehow 
and rapidly responding to this, not knowing Shabtai Tzvi, who he was, what it meant, except that there was this excitement about messianism, changed the title page and managed to put something on the, on the front of it, sort of declaring, and there's additional information within the, the book itself, with the Kalafan, that, that helps to indicate this. We know this because the, you'll see the engraving. This is a man riding a lion. In this case, he's not actually breathing fire, uh, but he has his mouth open, agape, with, you know, bearing his sharp teeth. And this is supposed to uh, represent Shabtai Tzvi, although, in my opinion, the printer wouldn't have known his name, simply that this is part of the vision at the time. Point being, with this excitement, here, I'm going to react immediately. There's something else. It's, this is out of Jewish messianic uh, enthusiasm. It's distinct from what's happening with the Gazette, but in the same regard, there is this immediate response. In the first week of February, the Gazette ran what might be called a hit piece in modern parlance. This Jewish messiah is an imposter, a pretended messiah, who was banished from his hometown of Smyrna, Smyrna several years earlier, who was the subject of such adoration that, quote, no, no Jew dare open his mouth against him. Mass Jewish delusion is coupled with strange acts, such as this supposed messiah's promise in their synagogue to raise a dead man from the grave. The image of such Jews drew on an anti-Jewish medieval heritage, including the notion of a kindred connection between Jews and the devil. As mentioned, the numbers of Jews in England at this time was minuscule. After centuries of anti-Jewish tropes, Jews as living and breathing individuals was not something English readers could relate to or identify with. As such, regular reporting of fantastic conquest in the East served another purpose, which the next appearance made clear. We have formally given some accounts of the Arabians and Jews' actions in Arabia. The more full relation, as we have it, runs thus. In Arabia, Felix, as in Yemen, lies the, king, the kingdom of Alal, in which the populous city of Eden, full of Jewish merchants, it lying near the Red Sea. In this city, we are informed, there's a Jew called Jeroboam, who by the, his powerful oratory hath in a few days reduced all the citizens to his devotion, who have slain their pasha and forced the garrison to submit to them. A little time after, that party grew very numerous and gave the absolute command of themselves to this Jeroboam, calling him their prophet. Since which time, growing more formidable, they, were, they marched with a very vast army into Arabia Petria and were possessed of the city of Medina and afterwards of Mecca. From whence they wrote to all the Jews of Edomia and Syria to prepare for their reception and that they are resolved in a short space to free them from their slavery to the Turk. The article appeared in mid-February, just two weeks after the previous one. Drawn from a cache of reports from Venice, the editors made a point to call the reader's attention to a previously recorded issue. Rather than Shabbatai, however, we learn a new prophet named Jeroboam, and again, have reference to the sack of Islamic holy places. The last line is jarring, and of course, the core of the Gazette's interests. Jews and Arabs, banding together, resolving to free the Jews of the Holy Land and beyond from their slavery under Turkish rule. In contrast to the few references to Jews, the London Gazette contained regular notices about Ottoman obstinacy or folly in the Eastern Mediterranean. Reference to Jewish messianism entailed assault on the one non-European empire that could hinder English mercantilism and imperial interests. A series of consecutive issues printed between February and March exhibited near exuberance over the prospect that the reports of Jewish muscle were true. As mentioned just now, issue 30 referred to release from, quote, slavery to the Turk. Issue number 33, reporting from Vienna, stated that, quote, the Jews in this city made a public jubilee with great expressions of joy upon the news that they had brought them of the success of their brethren in Asia against the Turk. Issue number 34, reporting from Constantinople, stated that Shabbatai, their pretended prophet, leads no less than 100,000 after him, and he's very severe against all Turks killing all they meet with. A week later, the Gazette criticized the lack of Turkish response to Jewish hysteria, as if to indicate Ottoman inability or lack of awareness. Still other editions express fear of Turks overrunning Euro Europe. Of course, the London Gazette was not, al was not alone. The letter from Aberdeen mentioned earlier explained that the group of Jews at port were embarking for the Dutch Republic and then for the Holy Land. Quote, they give liberty of conscience to all except the Turks, endeavoring the utter ruin and extirpation of them. Finally, among the most egregious sins and insult was for someone, including Shabbatai, we learn at the end of the saga in the fall of 1666, to, quote, turn Turk. By March, four months into the newspaper's publication, six or seven items had appeared in the Gazette concerning Jewish messianism, more relating to widespread and fantastic attack, attacks on the Ottoman Empire than to Shabtai Tzvi 
or Jews as living people. The editorial voice was present of inconsistent throughout the period. Parenthetical remarks and statements qualifying various reports appeared often. For instance, such and such a thing is reported, say they, or this Jewish restoration is, quote, foolishly imagined. Issue number 34, printed in March 1665, included a disclaimer. We have no small apprehension of those frequent intelligences we receive, all of them big with relations of great tumults in Palestine. What the apprehension was, however, is not entirely clear. The statement could reflect heavy skepticism as to the veracity of the reports, but it could also reflect a desire to check emotions, whether geopolitical excitement or even fear. In letters concurrently, written concurrently with the Gazette's publications, Henry Oldenburg of the newly formed Royal Society, relatively newly, sent letters to this effect to Spinoza and others. Apart from the millenarians who wish, wish for it, few believe the reports, he wrote in early December 1665. Quote, so long as this news is not conveyed from Constantinople by trustworthy men, I cannot believe it. I should like to know what the Amsterdam Jews have heard of this and how they are affected by such news which, if it were true, would seem to bring some catastrophe on the world. Oldenburg feared the collapse of the economic markets and supply chains. But as the months wore on with letters and news published regularly, the line be between belief and doubt and interest and fear blurred. His letters do not reflect a belief in the restoration of the Kingdom of Israel, but they, and the reports run by the London Gazette, reflect a concern that Jews everywhere would entirely abandon their business to follow the reported prophets and their march on Constantinople. Though established in the service of order, the London Gazette could not escape reflecting the overall feeling of uncertainty and confusion. In mid-April, the Gazette ran with a story claiming that Shabtai was condemned, humiliated, and flayed, as mentioned as I started with, and that the Jews of Constantinople were the objects of mob violence. There is relish in the gruesomeness. However, two months later, Shabbatayv was alive and well, with no retraction or acknowledgement from the paper. The Hebrews of this city of Smyrna have lately received a letter from Shabbatai, their prophet, from his prison in the castle of the Dardanelli, encouraging them to stand fast and not to waver in their opinions. For he had yet eight months left to work their restoration to Jerusalem, which he promises not of himself, the prophecy proceeding from a great seer at Gaza, who likewise foretells that their long-expected Messiah must be a man of suffering before he can arrive at, this, at his triumphal throne. This has extremely raised the people the, and possessed several of the wiser sort, who will hardly be reduced to their senses till the expiration of the eight months. This report served as one of the more sober and accurate accounts to appear in the Gazette, and several subsequent reports similarly reflected events we can verify through other sources. In other words, just to go back for one second, hear this reference to Shabbatai, he had been arrested and he was placed in prison for several months, and the way Nathan of Gaza, this prophet of the movement, the theologian of the movement, the way he dealt with it was to argue that the Messiah has to suffer, which sounds a little bit familiar, and hear the reporting then. In issues 95 and 96, printed in mid-October but stemming from letters from Leghorn, both dated the 28th of September, the Gazette reported more about Shabbatai's prison stay. The Jews persist, persist in their zeal to the pretended Messiah, who had turned their solemn fast for the destruction of their temple into a jubilee and can hardly be restrained from making their visits to him. These Jews, in their great zeal to the pretended, pretended Messiah, regularly flocked to him in his prison palace, while, quote, a new prophet had arisen in Sio, which is the island of Chios in the Aegean Sea. In November, the Gazette printed their final two notices about these mess messianic events, both sent from Leghorn, one dated the 24th of October and the other the 8th of November. The October notice again spoke of Shabtai in, sp in prison, his thousands of visitors, and the abrogation of mourning on the 9th of Av, and again included the usual references to Jewish delusion and Shabtai's imposture. However, it also contained two previously unaddressed developments. One, the true believers, Jews, had, dis quote, had dispensed with the eating of swine flesh. Though contradictory to pious Jewish living, that is, in religious, Jewish religious law, there is no eating of swine flesh. Um, the association of Jews with pigs 
and the supposed willingness of Jews to eat swine, let alone even more egregious depictions of Jews and pig feces in German, this is the Judensau, was a medieval trope that Frank Felsenstein has shown found renewed relevance in early modern England. The second development mentioned in this notice we know to have occurred. Facing the Sultan's threats to his safety, Shabbatai, quote, was content to lay by his royal titles with his religion and turn Turk and willing to, make, to take a, a mean servile employment. That is, after this year-long saga, Sabatai was content to abandon all that he'd worked for, convert to Islam, and accept a subservient role. It was October, yeah. But that, that one is, is today October 24th? Yeah. Okay. So there's a, can we use some Kabbalistic uh, analogy here? We're releasing sparks here while we're here. The final edition elaborated. An Ashkenazic Jew had visited Shabbatai, this is in prison, remember, spent days interviewing him and pressing him about, about his supposed mission before abandoning his own faith by converting to Islam. Again, this Ashkenazic Jew, it, the reference is that he turned Turk. The implication seems to be that Shabbatai, the imposter, was maddening, leading this man, whose story conforms somewhat to Nehemiah Cohen, who did meet Shabbatai in prison, uh, and who did convert to Islam, to reevaluate his own spiritual mission. The notice concludes, letters tell us that the Grand Signor, which is the expression for the Sultan, upon consideration of the great expectations and endeavors of the Jews to promote the interest of their new pretended king, had given command for the cutting off all that nation from seven years old and upwards, as in genocide which upon their humiliation and intercession of the new proselyte, which was revoked, which the Jews look upon as deliverance, not inferior to that procured by Queen Esther, and intend in remembrance of it to keep an anniversary feast of three days. In other words, the notice is claiming that there was an order of genocide against all Jews age seven and older, but then somehow this was revoked by the, both the humiliation and the uh, intercession of one of, one of the two here who, quote unquote, who, who converted to Islam, and that the Jews all looked at this as if this is deliverance akin to Purim. So, the London Gazette reported that the Sultan, furious at the threat Shabbatai posed, put in motion plans for a mass genocidal attack on Jews. Only through the intercession of the new proselyte, and in, like I just said, either Shabbatai himself or this man who had visited him, did the Jews escape. In response, they were going to establish an annual festival of three days in commemoration of their deliverance akin to the biblical story and the holiday of Purim. The concluding references, about which we have no corroborating sources as far as I know, present a problem of origin of sources. That's just in general, but especially for what we're dealing with here with the Gazette. Questions abound relating to how and when an editor intervened. Regardless, the remark, the last of 13 notices printed over nearly a year, settled the matter. The Jews, quote unquote, returned to their usual domesticated place, the crown was secure, and life could return to whatever normal is. How do we assess the attitude conveyed in the London Gazette towards Shabtai Tzvi, this messianic movement, and Jews as a whole at such a critical juncture in English and Jewish history? Overall, the reports show no sign of consistency. Some describe mass movements of the Ten Tribes with little to no connection to Shabtai Tzvi, Nathan of Gaza, or messianic stirrings in the Holy Land. Reports came in randomly and frequently, and the, edit and the editor, Henry Muddiman, was forced to determine when and how to convey the news. And just as a side note, Muddiman himself did not stay on as editor for a long period of time. It was in the, the early years only. As stated earlier, historians have assessed two primary views towards Jews during this, this time. One, millenarian, which regarded Jews as theologically useful and hoped for messianic success. And two, for lack of a better term, political, which relied on economic usefulness of Jews and thereby regarded Shabtai as an imposter. The London Gazette manifested tension between the two attitudes, tied as the movement was to potentially damaging the Ottoman Empire. And there was, of course, the additional issue of conceiving of Jews as more than just an image. It is true that an extremely small number of Jews lived in England at the time of these events. As I've argued, most of this is not about it's not about Jews, per se, in terms of the actual text. But, but Menashe ben Israel's hope for the total readmission of Jews to England succeeded sufficiently 
that Jews living in London a decade later in the 1660s were doing so openly. Famously, Samuel Pepys wrote in his diary about his visits to Jewish synagogue, uh, synagogue service, services. Although I've argued that the Gazette's reporting of the Messianic events did not reflect an overt concern of or for Jews per se, I also wonder how the frequent reporting, frequent reporting of Messianic events with its biting editorial criticism related to the contemporary issue of Jewish resettlement in England. Moreover, and certainly the subject of another lecture, how did the Messianic movement and the Gazette's reporting influence English attitudes to Jews in the coming decades? Thank you. Showing all these complex uh, rumors and fantasy and fact and reports uh, in the London and Oxford and London guess that's very very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, if you have questions. No, he told me he would be asking a question, and I had to prepare for it. So the material in, ge in general uh, in the Gazette is serious related to economic issues and political issues uh, and legal issues. So the fact is, is that I have a sense that, there, first of all, there can't be a single sort of approach of one reader. Um, I think that there's a range. There's a, there might be this like lightness initially, but then I think that there's some moment where there's this this question as to are, how seriously are we supposed to take this? And that's where relating it to the fact that one of the, one of the key issues that shows up here, uh, consistently in the Gazette is the Ottomans, uh, is the issue of, okay, is this not, not as they're going to be a restoration of the Kingdom of Israel, but what are, the, what are these Jews doing? And is there really something going to happen here? Um, you know, initially it could have been sort of funny, but I'm not so, it's, it's also very hard to tell. The reason I was thinking of Henry Oldenburg, and actually uh, Yossi mentioned uh, I, the, his analogy of uh, Newton and Einstein. I was thinking of Newton at one point with this, knowing of course Newton the scientist, but in fact he was a deeply religious and mystical individual, and the Royal Society and the activity there was not, you know, it's not bifurcated as we may conceive of today. So therefore, um, what are we actually looking at in terms of belief or disbelief and, and the possibilities? I, and I, I don't know the actual answer to this, except that it's not quite so simple as, oh, okay, this is uh, to be disregarded. Yes? I'm just uh, interested about, you spoke at the beginning that the name changed from the Oxford Gazette to the London Gazette. Right. And so I was wondering just, uh, where was it visibly printed? Where were the offices where the entries worked? Was it always in London or was it in Oxford so the, or what? Okay, good Why question. was the name changed? So there was a plague in London. We've heard of the Black Death. So from the point of what took place with the Black Death in 1348 and 49, which in which upwards of, uh, I mean, I don't really know what where scholars fall on this now, but a third of the European population died in this period. 1665, the plague that took place in London in 1665 was the, as the, the next most deadly appearance of a plague. Charles II was, feared the, the plague in London, so he re relocated the court to Oxford in the autumn of 1665. They founded the, a gazette which would be now this newspaper of the monarchy in November 1665, and they called it the Oxford Gazette. Here it was printed in Oxford by Leonard Litchfield and then reprinted in London. So in, in essence, here we have, it's printed in Oxford, it's sent to London, then they're going to reprint it there. He, they 
keeping track of the mortality rates meant that by the time of the late winter 1666, meaning February or so, the court had determined that they can return to London. And so at that point, it became the London Gazette. So the first 20 or so uh, issues were the Oxford Gazette. But then it really became the London Gazette, and that's what it's known today, known as today. So that's a great question. So I've always been, so within the study of early modern Jewish history, people love Shabtai Tzvi, love this story. The whole Jewish world is enamored with Shabtai Tzvi. Everybody, there's all this hubbub of messianism. And I was, all, whenever, for me personally, whenever lots of people think something, I am skeptical. Uh, so my feeling until very recently was the claims of, you know, the whole Jewish world, 90% of the Jews, you know, they, saying that, I was always skeptical of that because the fact is when you get down to it, um, how do, who do we know or how do you measure who's actually believing or not believing? The evidence is, is that there are individuals who are selling their property, who are not engaging in business. It's large enough that it's showing up in something like this. Uh, the biggest measure that was ever, that I ever, it resonated with me coming from a scholar at Princeton named Jakob Dweck. Um, when I asked him this question, he said that they, they ab abrogated the fast of the, 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 ninth of, the fast of the ninth of Av, meaning Tisha B'Av, which is the most solemn day of the year. The fact that they did that shows that this was something that was huge. And the question as to numbers and to the degree of it, I think that, again, we always have to sort of, you'll have varying degrees of all of this. Having said that, I'd go to this, which is what I've been thinking about lately. There's something in the air enough that a printer in Venice responded by claiming or by celebrating that the Messiah has arrived. And there's more to it as to how I, you know, why I make that argument. But this is a book of Maimonides. There's no change to the text. In essence, what had happened was that they had finished the text, the, the printing, finished basically the text block, and all they needed to do was they sort of shifted the title page. I mean, this is for anybody who's looked at dozens or hundreds of title pages before, it's unusual that you would have this frame sort of at the bottom of it and just plastering something at the top. Um, with that excitement, okay, so here, the Messiah has arrived and we're ready for this. But it didn't change anything in terms of sort of everyday life, I think, for this particular printer and that response. Yes, sir. So piggyback, I've said it's useful to, remember, to bear in mind the distinction between believing in Shabtai Tzvi and knowing something about Shabtai Tzvi and the, 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 thought, the thinking at the core of the movement and uh, subscribing to a traditional Jewish messianic right. belief and hearing rumors that the Messiah had come. So I think it's fair to say that most of the people outside of the core uh, of where things were actually happening were, were simply enthusiastic about the Messiah having come and knew almost nothing about yes. Shabbat Tzvi. And it's very well put, and there's one other thing to add to that, which is when, there, when it was known to some rabbis or scholars that there was an abrogation of Jewish law, um, many of them had debated and sort of kept quiet because of this, the the, excite, the enthusiasm was leading to greater piety. So how do you tell the how do you tell people to stop being most more of the literature pious? That was, that was spreading quickly. That Nathan himself was responsible for spreading was penitential in its orientation right. and not yeah. the radical Kabbalah. Right. Uh, Moshe. Yeah. Uh, to what extent this uh, seemingly imaginary nature of those reforms? Uh, seen also when they report about uh, the new world. Uh, I have in mind all those um, uh, fascination boxes when they presented new animals and new, and it seems that um, when it's beyond uh, Europe, um, no rationale is, 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 
Yeah. He's working. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I mean, we could link this if we wanted to be even more political about it in terms of approaches by the 18th century with Orientalism and what that's supposed to mean. But certainly, the reports here of these ten lost tribes coming out of Arabia, and they, it complete, it's, it's in essence the same thing of what we're getting from Menashe ben Israel with his uh, report of Antonio de, de Montezinos and others who are claiming it. With this new world, look, of course we're going to find... It, 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 to me, it's that here this is new discovery and it must be bringing it you know, to the past and we're gonna all, it will all be revealed, so to speak. Um, but again, it's beyond my own, my own area to, to go that far. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. It was fascinating. So going back to what Moshe has just asked about the reports and yeah. the origin of these reports, yeah. so they are imaginary, but they are, from what you have shown at the beginning, they are shown as retransmitted either via the Italians or, you know, there is, do you have any direct reports? Because this period, it's actually what, 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 what is happening in, uh, in, in, in Ottoman Empire. Yes. We have people like Pocock and Huntington and we have this amazing colonial enterprise of the Levantine mm -hmm. uh, commercial company. So they are actually English people and a lot of them trading with the Ottoman Empire and sitting in Izmir, in Istanbul and in Aleppo. I don't know about Yemen, that's what I'd like to know. That's the period of Shabazi, you know, and, yeah. uh, and, yeah, and Shabazi, Eastern, uh, Messianism. But um, I don't know about, about the contacts with, uh, so with, uh, with Arabia. And, uh, but you know, but is there any evidence that these people being really trading in the Ottoman Empire uh, send information to the Gazette. Yes, the there's the archi there is archival evidence that I have not conducted yet, I hope to. Uh, Brandon Marriott, who wrote his dissertation here, deals with this aspect specifically. Um, trying to trace where some, not specifically with the Gazette, but rather pamphlets or letters that are sent both in the Dutch Republic or in Germany, also in England, as to how is something transmitted from, from the Ottoman Empire to Europe? Um, we don't have Ottoman archives or additional sources sort of from the Ottoman side as to know exactly where are the Europeans who are there getting their source, meaning if they're sending these letters saying, we have heard of such and such, the question is where they're getting it from. And I'm not sure that that can be answered, but there is an ability to to locate at least some connections as to the fantastical stories and how they make their way. The, the thing about the Gazette is that not everything, in fact, much of what appears here does not appear in these letters. In a very general sense, okay, the 10 lost tribes, or the, that's one thing. But some of the specific things, the death of Shabtai Tzvi, that sort of thing, doesn't appear as far as I know in the letters that we know of that are proliferating in Northern Europe. Uh, so that would be the other question as to how to trace that. Okay, we thank okay, the thank speakers. You, John. Thank you very much.